Welcome, aloha. Thanks for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. Happy November 9th. And may this, the day after the 2023 elections, give us a chance to see if we can read some of the tea leaves and see what, if anything, those might mean, signify, or portend. And we have with us today the absolutely brilliant, intuitive, incisive, insightful, and lovely Vicki Cayetano, the wife and adult supervision for our good friend and former governor, Ben Cayetano, probably the most highly spirited governor we have ever had in all the ways that really mean the most. And a man that you can tell him I said this, I admire, respect, and love dearly. Ben is a hero. I mean, for many, he stood up for little guys in heptachlor and lots of stuff where nobody else did. And he worked with David Shutter and kept David Shutter under adult management in ways nobody else could after that. Because I know, talk to Gary Levitt, Judy Davey, all of it can't be done. But Ben did it. Ben Davis, retired professor emeritus from the University of Toledo School of Law, now visiting professor at Washington and Lee School of Law in Charlottesville, Virginia. And Ben deserves and will take full credit for Virginia going blue <laughs> in yesterday's elections at a level and to an extent it has never done in its history. And Tem Apicella, the voice of wisdom and sageness. Without the parsley and rosemary, only the sage. Tim Apicella. All right, folks, Ben, you're in Virginia. What the heck happened and what does it mean? Um, I think, yeah, I, I, first of all, I, I just think that uh, people are very lucid about uh, what, what, what was at stake. Um, I, you know, there, 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 there are some efforts to, I think, gaslight people on certain issues, right? They uh, this whole uh, Youngkin uh, fifteen week abortion compromise language and that kind of stuff, and um, I do think that that strong reaction to the Dobbs overruling is going through the the electorate, and they're not just they're not buying the uh, the gaslighting anymore. I mean. And and so you know you just sort of see uh, this effort, uh, uh, the, these changes, uh, this kind of determination to just sort of get rid of it because it's just uh, get rid of those kinds of candidates uh, who uh, who are kind of following that particular party line. Uh, I think that this is something that is so deep and so powerful going through. The electorate that uh, it you know people are just not going to to listen. I I was thinking also, I mean, if you want to think about even trying to play sophisticated games, for example, in Ohio they had the uh, what was it the August let's try to increase the uh, threshold to sixty percent, and people voted no, and then November voted yes for uh, putting. Uh, reproductive rights in the Constitution. Well, that shows to me a, a level of sophistication of the voter that could understand the games that the quote-unquote smart people were trying to play with them, uh, and they were not letting themselves be played. So I think that's the thing that uh, I, is, I, I take away. Uh, I think also uh, Kentucky I understand there was this ad of a 12-year-old girl who had been raped by her stepfather that was, you know, there was no answer. There was no answer under under the, uh, from, from the candidate running, uh, who was, you know, sort of for uh, not allowing reproductive rights and abortion. There was just no answer to that story. And because, you know, there's, like, people know realities, and they are determined to stop the 
the games of uh, being played, uh, which obviously are successful in a certain sense that the people putting these games forward are probably getting uh, uh, donors, you know, donor funds and all that is working for them. But in the voting booth, absolutely people are not willing to be gaslighted. I think that's really what it is. So let me take that and say one of the things I'm hearing is, and Ron DeSantis and Nikki and the rest of them better listen, is it's not about woke or unwoke. The word is awakening. People are awakening. They're not just lucid. They are what physicians call alert and oriented times three. Mm -hmm. Person, place, and time. It's the initial question of physicians, especially neurologists, especially after injuries, head injuries in particular. So, Vicki, what do you take from it? Anything? You know, I would start my statements with two questions that I would ask you all, okay? One is that, what do you think of Senator Joe Manchin's statement that he is not going to run for re-election? Okay, how is that going to impact? Will it benefit the Democrats or will it actually hurt them? Uh, the second question I have is, while many Democrats celebrate the outcome of Tuesday's elections, next year's election is going to really involve a much larger electorate base. And I think a less informed, not as well-informed base of people. Do you think that the Democrats will have as much success given all those considerations? So the Great first question. is Manchin's, you know, a, a statement that he's not running for re-election. Do you think it helps or hurts the Democrats or it's neutral? Well, I think there's a strategic tactical mistake that the Democrats and Manchin have made because they, they haven't been engaging in trade-offs. They're not getting anything for them. The trade-off should be, okay, we'll have Manchin not run if you have Tuberville not run. It would be the greatest contribution to the U.S. Senate in decades. To dispense with those two, can you imagine how much that would raise the bar of communications, of dialogue, of potential bipartisan engagement without those two? In the Senate, I mean, yeah, there are others, you know, Cruz and the boys, and you know, they're more than enough hey, haters and dividers out there. But those two alone, their removal might signify something to the rest of the bunch to help them understand exactly what you and Ben have said. We are awakening. You are at risk. Tim, your thoughts. Uh, thinking about Virginia and um, the success that we ex they experienced on Tuesday, I'm thinking, what if that hadn't happened? Um, you would have had Youngston probably say, okay, I, I was able to control now the, um, the legislature in my state. And that would have been a springboard to him saying, I'm going to be a presidential candidate for the GOP party in 2024. Now, who has a real chance of beating Donald Trump? Uh, maybe Youngston. I not think anymore. he does. And so by the fact not, that- Not Trump, anymore. Well, that, and that's the point. He now is, he's pulling his oars in off the boat and he's not gonna run. And so what's the, big, what's the biggest goal or the largest goal in 2024? It has to be the defeat of Donald Trump. Uh, he's going to get the nomination uh, without, now that Youngston is going to, you know, not run for 2024, he will be the nominee. And I was hoping that Youngston would have gotten in there and and tried to uh, wrestle that away from Donald Trump. And I think he would have had the greatest chance of success. So in some ways, there's some collateral damage here from this victory. Uh, but that is the life of politics. And um, yeah. that's my initial thought. So what if we follow that thought? and say, okay, <clears throat> Young can crash and burn for exactly the reasons that Ben and Vicky have articulated. The awakening, 
are there, is there anyone on the Republican side that might sufficiently grasp, make use of, and benefit from that to step up? Is there somebody who could be an awakening GOP candidate? Think. That's um, the question. I'll just give you a quick answer. No. Yeah. Um, the bottom line is, if they're not willing to bludgeon themselves and Donald Trump at the same time, because they're scared about losing the base for support, and so they're timid, uh, they'll, th they'll throw a couple of crackpot shots out there during the debate. But other than that, they retreat back into their hermit crab shell, and that's where they stay. So we need a candidate on the GOP side that's willing to go head first, headlong into Donald Trump. Uh, Chris Christie's the closest one that comes to that. Uh, but he's not getting any traction. And um, that's the bottom line. If anyone's going to yeah. take the nomination, they can't do it by not taking Donald Trump um, right on for the headway, toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe and head-to-head. -head. Yeah, I'm going to play devil's advocate and, and raise the possibility that there may be another approach, another image, another strategy that may be even more successful than taking Trump on one-to-one. -one. Because fighting with a bully is rarely productive. It's like a pissing match with a skunk. You come out with a really bad smell, right? What if instead somebody got out there, as Tim Scott originally intended to do, but has proven really incapable of doing, somebody got out there and really did some serious image and strategy work to be the GOP awakening candidate? Somebody like Kassinich used to be that kind of person. Well, this, what if that happened? It, I mean, they might not get the nomination, but if it happened, if it showed the GOP that there is a reality, there is a direction, there is a group, there are people, there is a faction that is willing to go in the awakening direction. Right. That's so, the question. If, if I could jump in on that, a Please. couple thoughts came. Uh, one was that that kind, of, that kind of strategy, I think, is sort of, if for presidentials at least, it, it's like setting up a 2028 as opposed to 2024 because of the, the dominance of, of Trump right now. I, I, I saw on the commentaries last night something that I thought was very interesting, which is, well, Trump has this dominance, you still have roughly 30% of the, or 32% of the Republican electorate that is split up among these other uh, candidates, right? Um, in a general election, uh, looking forward to this broader vision question of uh, that Vicky pointed out, uh, Trump needs every one of those 30% 32% who have been watching and have decided they are not with him and he needs them badly and I think that that's a very telling point is that at, at this point in time even though he's the quote front runner I think that that's significant that there are a number of Republicans who are looking for something else uh, and the uh, the second thing I would wanted to say, just to try to speak to the Joe Manchin thing, um, is my understanding was that Joe Manchin had not done a very good job, or the Democratic Party had not done a very good job of creating heirs apparent in West Virginia. And so as a consequence, you know, there's kind of a vacuum behind him on the Democratic side. And so my expectation is I, I think the, the governor will probably run um, for the Senate seat at some point, uh, maybe if, I don't know if he's, and uh, I think he's a Republican. So I see it going over to the Republican side, though my sense of the Republican governor as a, uh, during the whole COVID thing was that he was tending to be sort of what I would call a reasonable person, not the Tommy Tuberville type. So, uh, he might be sort of the center right if i can talk about it that sense part of the republican party maybe uh now i just want to add other, any another thing you know the flamethrowers in the house group 
is one of my my representative is one of the flamethrowers, one of the five, the Gates Five sort of thing, you know. And so, I I, I watched that, and uh, the comment that I heard someone make about those kind of settings was that you needed to have an independent run in the district uh, who would have democratic basically leaning views in terms of various things but without the the democratic label uh, so you know that's another twist that maybe could happen in west virginia having an independent so i just throw that one out there so who in the democratic party could move to west virginia in time to run for senate <clears throat> pete Buttigieg, Pete yeah. um who would you if, if you could go to the Democratic Party and say, tell this guy to, or a woman, better yet, a woman, what woman could move to West Virginia in time to win mention Senate seat? And also, don't forget, you know, when we talk about Tuberville, well, Dems, Democrats could lose mansion seat. The Republicans could lose Tuberville seat. Even in Alabama. Alabama is? Yeah. They, they could conceivably lose that seat if the Democrats put up somebody who has really broad, moderate, even conservative appeal. You know, a states person, a, yeah. somebody with charisma. If either, if either party figures out that you win by putting up the most charismatic candidates, they will clean up. Obama won by charisma and grassroots, that combination. Nobody has had it since. Nobody had it before. Hey, Jimmy Carter developed it after his presidency and unfortunately is not strong enough now to be able to use it to the benefit of either the party or society. But who in the Democratic Party, just hypothetical imagining, Vicki, Tim, would you say if they moved to West Virginia, they could win? Anybody? Go ahead, Vicki. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay, I'll take I'll take one shot on, and then it's Vicky's turn. <laughs> it's um, be, I'd say Governor it's Whitmer. It's not going to be Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. No, Governor Governor Whitmer. I think uh, you know what. That's that's a brilliant, brilliant suggestion. Vicki? So, you know, I, I think she has a possibility, but here, here's my question, and I think, Ben, you probably know the politics that side better. Is this somebody who's going to move there, or is that actually more of a weak point versus someone from from within their state? Right. Is, right. Do they have Harvey candidates had, there? Right. Yeah. I uh, you know, I I mean I I don't know West Virginia uh, real real well, but I I I would suspect that you know somebody organically local um, that uh, but then it, you know is there anybody in the Democratic Party local who has really got that some stature inside West Virginia? I I just don't know. I yeah. uh, I understood that Mansion had really pushed. You know, and I'd really not developed it. Now, there is the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, where I understand uh, the people have been very sophisticated based on the kind of results we're seeing in different types of elections. In, uh, uh, I don't know if it or the De Democratic Leadership. I can't. I don't know which which acronym it is, but they've been very sophisticated and successful in getting uh, Democrats elected in different places. So they may be already working on somebody or have been working on for a time, somebody to come up in Manchin's background. Uh, but uh, I, I, yeah, I, I do think that the person coming from out of state would be, they'd be less receptive. It's not like, uh, what was it? Uh, Robert Kennedy moving to New York, you know, or Hillary Clinton moving to New York, sort of the flexibility that was there shown in New York towards them. Uh, I think that there's there's you know there's there's definitely a specificity to West Virginia that uh, yeah. you know that is that is that is remarkable in, in a in a beautiful way you know 
So, mm -hmm. and there may, maybe is there somebody from within? I would think that oftentimes when a candidate decides not to run, <clears throat> a lot of times they're chief of staff, yes. someone who's already yes. built relationships, right? It's yes. just like Senator Inoue. There was a lot of talk about Jennifer Sabas, you know, running. Uh, because the, all those years they've learned, uh, they've got the playbook down, um, they've been yeah. waiting. So yeah. that, that could be another possible, I think, absolutely. somebody from within his camp. I don't know who Manchin's chief of staff is, but absolutely. I've, that's a route that very, very, you know, they've got all the network that's worked for Manchin up to now. Um, and that puts them in a front spot if they're willing to take on that role, you know, so, yeah. So I would propose who I believe would be the perfect candidate for West Virginia were he still alive, which unfortunately he is not, and who would come with the greatest theme song for a West Virginia Senate campaign of anyone ever, and that would be John Denver. John Denver. All right. Denver. If they can come up with a John Denver, you know, and, and I'm only half joking because if they can get someone you know, the West Virginia equivalent of Taylor Swift, if there were such a thing. Yeah, well, you know, isn't that sad? She's a little too progressive for West Virginia, but. You know, star power is not a bad thing. And I'm sorry to say that between social media's impact to politics today, it carries tremendous weight. And people today, their attention span is like this much. Mm. You're winning on sound bites, not on the depth and breadth of your experience. Those days are long gone. And that's really what's sad. But I, I think that if there's a candidate that people can resonate with, I think this is why Donald Trump is successful. Frankly, he speaks things that people say, that's what I would like to say, but don't say so they interpret that instead of arrogance as courage you know i talk to these supporters and i'm like well how in the world can you support someone like donald trump and oftentimes that's the thing oh he's he's honest he says things that the other candidates want to say but they don't have the balls to say it mm. i mean it's so simplistic it's ridiculous right. it's, it's, it's sad it's sad but true vicky and i guess what you know, in politics, they say, uh, you know, an elected politician is either a show horse or a workhorse. <laughs> and unfortunately, the workhorses that know how to get the job done, they're not charismatic enough now in today's politics to be elected. And I, when I said it was sad, that's what I'm referring to. It's just plain sad. That's where we're at as far as who gets elected, who gets campaign dollars. And um, it's just, I, I, give, me, give me five workhorses to 30 show horses any day. But you left out the third category, which is the by far the great, great, great majority, almost virtually all. And that's the horse's assets, the other part of the horse. <laughs> we got plenty of that in the Congress, I'll tell you that. We, we, <laughs> we got we an got abundance. overpopulated <laughs> with horse's assets. We got a, oh, wow. You know, name me a workhorse or a show horse that really deserves that title. I, I think there are none that I can think of. But horses' asses. Because I, they know what they're doing. And Tuberville's at the top of the list, man. Yeah. So I want to circle back to Marjorie's the- Marjorie's right up there. You know, show for you, Chuck. You, this is, can you read the tea leaves for next year? So is Tuesday's results an indication of how the national- uh, election next year is going to go, or are we going to be blindsided, or do we not even know how next year's election results will go? Or is it an opportunity, a potential for momentum, that if properly understood and built on, can make 2024 an even better one for the Democrats? I, I truly believe that's what it is. It's not a direction, it's a potential. It's not an achievement, it is, but it's an opportunity. If the Democratic leadership coalesces, learns to build relationships and teams, and understands what happened 
in 2022, what happened in 2023, and why, and how that connects, which people in the party can bring that to the electorate and be the awakening candidates. So my theme, if I were a Democratic Party person, like Richard, Fort, right, is I would say this 2024, our theme will be awakening. We are the awakening party. We're not woke. We're not unwoke. We're not left. We're not right. We're not socialist. We're not communist. We are awakening. We are awakening with and to the people. Well said, Chuck. Yeah. But I think I would, uh, my closing statements would be focused around saying then the Democratic Party needs to be more unified. We have our own issues locally and nationally. Uh, there are so many segments, you know, you've got the very liberal side. Um, so I think there needs to, to be strong party leadership in order to address the very thing, that strategy that I think is, you know, wisely stated by you in order to execute. But if we don't clean up and take care of our own house, I don't know that that's going to happen. So question for you, Vicki, is having taken all of the insights and perspectives and wisdom that Ben and Tim and you have shared and essentially giving you a potential 2024 campaign theme and platform. Are you willing to consider running for mayor? <laughs> you know, I and am not a... dead serious. You know, I'm not a politician. Public service is something I, I think is very important, but as That's a not politician, a negative. no. Um, I, I, at this point, I, you know, you never say never, but I have no aspiration. Good. I'm sorry to hear that. I want to vote for you. <laughs> oh, we're uh, Jay will lead and Tim will lead, and, and the rest of us will support a draft Vicky campaign for mayor. There you go. Um, I, much as I like Rick Blangieri personally, sorry, not even close. If he were a baseball pitcher, he would not have survived the inning. <laughs> and I don't mean that as a personal criticism. I just mean he, he walked into a situation where the difficulties, the obstacles, and the challenges, the opposition, the resistance, all of the things in the way of his making the progress that he wanted to <clears throat> have defeated him. He's I think he's done the best he could with what he has. I think, on the other hand, it's time for the manager to walk out of the dugout and say, hand me the damn ball. Who in the bullpen, if not you, who is in the bullpen for Hawaii? Tim, Vicki, last words. I'll let Tim have the last word. <laughs> okay, well, get him, well, in the bullpen nationally, I, I... No, no, Hawaii, mayor. Oh, uh, I defer to Vicky. <laughs> Sorry, Vicky. Yeah. I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know. Okay, I think, I think I'll you're the one. Both out. I'll help you both out. I, I'm running for mayor. Okay. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Ben. All right. Ben's <laughs> moving to Hawaii and running for mayor. I, and I have, I have, I have my, my, my uh, motto, vote for me, I'll set you free. There you go. <laughs> there, Ben. And Ben, if you want to be an adjunct professor at the UH Law School, Richardson School of Law, it's one of the best in the country. It has probably one of the top five deans in the country, Camille Nelson, yeah. who is absolutely amazing off the freaking charts. We've run out of time. I'm so sorry. We have lots more to say and share. Come back and join us in a couple of weeks. Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Be well. Be safe. And awaken, please. I agree. Aloha.